afternoon, we're going to be talking about how scientific advances can unexpectedly, no matter how well-intentioned, be somewhat controversial. We are also going to talk about and learn about some breakthroughs that promise to restore sight and hearing. And we're going to talk in depth about the very human consequences and ethical implications of these new technologies. We're going to begin our conversation on hearing, we're going to move to sight, and then we're all going to discuss this together. So I'd like to begin by introducing our first participant, who is at the forefront of understanding hearing loss and the science of trying to regain it. A graduate of Harvard and Harvard Medical School, he's currently a professor of neuroscience at Rockefeller University and a winner of the 2018 Kavli Prize in Neuroscience. Please welcome James Hudspeth. Our next participant probably doesn't need an introduction, but of course she is the Oscar winner and Golden Globe winning actor who's appeared on everything from the West Wing to Dancing with the Stars. She's also one of the most prominent members of and advocates for the deaf community. She's joined by her longtime interpreter, Jack Jason. Please welcome Marley Matlin. <laughs> welcome, have a seat everyone. <laughs> Okay, Jim, I want to start with you. Can you tell us exactly how uh, hearing works? How do sounds get into the brain to become coherent? Explain it. So we'll begin with a short video from the National Institutes of Health that touches on that. So let's see that, please. Okay, let's take a look at the video. Have you ever wondered how sounds make their way from the source all the way to your brain? Take a trumpet, for instance. When it's played, it makes sound waves in the air. The outer ear catches the waves, which then travel through a narrow passageway called the ear canal. The sound waves reach the eardrum, which is a membrane roughly half the size of a dime. They make the eardrum vibrate, which in turn vibrates three tiny bones called the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones amplify or increase the sound vibrations and send them to the cochlea. The cochlea is shaped like a snail and is the size of a garden pea. It is filled with fluid, and the sound vibrations make this fluid ripple, which creates waves. Hair-like structures called stereocilia sit on top of hair cells and are grouped together as hair cell bundles inside the cochlea. The hair cells inside the cochlea ride these waves, and the hair bundles are moved. The hair bundle on top of the hair cell turns these movements into electrical signals. As the hair bundles are moved, ions rush into the top of the hair cells, causing the release of chemicals at the bottom of the hair cells. The chemicals bind to the auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal, which travels along the auditory nerve to the brain. Different hair cells respond to different frequencies of sound. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher-pitched sounds, such as a piccolo or flute. The hair cells toward the top of the spiral detect progressively lower-pitched sounds, such as a trumpet or trombone. At the very top, or apex, of the spiral, the hair cells detect the lowest-pitched sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain which interprets the messages as sounds that we recognize and understand. You want to expand on that, Jim? Sure. Um, I think the important thing about what our hearing is doing all the time, even as we converse here, is shown in the next slide. This is a graph mm -hmm. that shows about two and a half seconds of human speech. It's my voice. And on the vertical axis, there are different frequencies of sound. So what you can see as you move across progressively are some relatively low frequencies, some relatively high frequencies, and these turn out to be different syllables. This is the end of a Dylan Thomas poem, Fern Hill. As I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. The next slide shows that this piece is though I sang in my chains like the sea. And you can see that the low frequency sounds are vowels, though, ang, ains, and so on. And the high frequencies are consonants. 
So say, chains, see, and what have you. And this is what the cochlea has to do. It takes this complex set of sounds and breaks them down into different frequencies. It, in effect, does the opposite of what a piano does. A piano takes independent oscillators or strings and melds their sounds together to make a wonderful whole. The ear undoes that work and produces separate oscillations at different positions along the length of the cochlea. There are a total of 16,000 hair cells, sensory receptor cells. Now, the name hair cells is unfortunate. These have nothing to do with the kind of hair that I used to have. Uh, <laughs> that you still do have. You're magnificent. <laughs> OK, don't rub it in. Yeah. Uh, um, these are called hair cells because they have these little bristles sticking out, but they're only a thousandth as big as a real human hair and only a millionth as long. They're absolutely tiny. And the key point is that each of them is tuned to a different frequency. So as you move along the snail-like cochlea, you move from the highest of pitches at the base towards lower and lower pitches as you move all the way up. And only the specific hair cells will vibrate in response to a particular sound with particular frequencies. A higher magnification shows more clearly these little bristles or hairs sticking out of the top of one of these cells. You can see how the system actually moves. On the left, you have a hair bundle that is not disturbed. There's a little glass rod at the upper left that's then pressed against it. And you can see that the device moves the hair bundle side to side. And that's what's going on in your ears all the time. As you are listening, the individual hair bundles, like this device, are oscillating back and forth in phase with the sound that you're listening to. Talk to me about the causes of hearing loss. It's, it's known that only 10% of deaf children are born to deaf parents, is that correct? So what are the variety of causes? Okay, so there are five principal causes of hearing loss. The first one you've already alluded to, and that is genetic. Mm -hmm. So approximately one child in a 1,000 is born deaf or becomes deaf soon thereafter from genetic mm -hmm. causes. The next cause is infection. So this can be maternal rubella. Mm -hmm. It can be later in life meningitis, encephalitis, or any disease that affects the, that, this portion of the brain. The third cause is legitimate drugs. By this, I mean drugs like aminoglycosides, neomycin, mm -hmm. genomycin. These are things that need to be used to deal with serious infections like endocarditis. Also, anti-cancer drugs, such as cisplatin, are used as the major chemotherapeutics for uh, ovarian cancer or testicular cancer. And as a side effect, both of those can devastate the ear. The fourth cause is what's called acoustic trauma, which is simply exposure to excessively loud sound. Now, that can be self-inflicted by musical devices, but it also comes about from the workplace and in military environment. The last and the largest category is what's called presbycusis, which is literally the hearing of old men. This is the gradual deterioration of our hearing faculty with age. And it's probably compounded of two different things. Partly, th there is a deterioration of the fine blood vessels that go to the ear, just as there are to the vessels that go to the eye, the heart, the brain, and so on. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there's daily wear and tear. Anybody who's crossed the street in New York knows that it's an extremely loud environment. And that is constantly whittling away at our 16,000 hair cells, and sadly, they are not replaced. When they're gone, they're gone. When we talk about total numbers of people, how many millions of people are we talking about in this country who, who are somewhat or completely affected by hearing loss? Yeah, so I'd say there are three categories. There are between 500,000 and 1 million people who are profoundly deaf. They have essentially no functioning hearing. There in the United States. In the United States, excuse mm -hmm. me, quite so. In the United States, there are approximately 10 million who have significant severe hearing loss, mm -hmm. enough so that they can't carry out a conversation in ordinary circumstances. Most of them need, or in fact many, use a hearing aid. And the total number is about 30 million in the United States. The last 20 million being people who are moderately affected. There are people who have a hard time conducting a conversation in a crowded environment, mm -hmm. on the subway, or in other noisy environments. So it's a tenth of the total population. I want to talk to Marley now, who's 
obviously a very prominent member of the deaf community, but I want to discuss first the arrangement that you and Jack have and how you work together for people who might not be familiar um, with your relationship and how that works when you're performing professionally and in rehearsals, and then we'll talk a little bit more about personally. So I have a lot of questions for him as well about hearing us. In any case, um, so interpreters. So this, first of all, is my friend, Jack as well, is my friend as well. And uh, Jack is, Jack learned to sign uh, before he learned to speak because he has deaf parents. So he's called what's a coda, a child of deaf adults. So when I met Jack in New York here, in New York City, um, I just grabbed him on my fishing line and hooked him in. <laughs> my feeling was is that when we met, we connected. Um, and the way he signs and the way he translates for me makes me feel satisfied, makes my life easy. Mm -hmm. and that, we can talk about that and what my life is all about a little bit later in terms of ease. Uh, as far as working together, I uh, bring him with me to events like this, or if we make appearances on television, for example, in an interview, or if we are going to a meeting uh, with executives or studio types. We have, a, we have formed a sort of a working relationship where I don't necessarily have to worry about what he is saying on my behalf. I should, perhaps. <laughs> There is a great deal of, uh, well, it's, it's not a great deal, but um, there, it's, it's hard work for an interpreter to be able to translate what a deaf person is saying, signing, uh, into spoken English. I myself couldn't interpret for a deaf person the way that Jack is doing it, what Jack is doing like right now. I couldn't do what he's doing. I, I don't know if I'm necessarily that smart, but um, I mean, I don't mean smart, I'm not that, I don't have that talent. Um, he just makes me look good. That's basically how, what, what we do. It's been a 33, a 34 year, 34, 30, 34 year relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I pay him nicely too, so that's fine. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so that, I mean, do you enjoy the job? Well, it, it's an interesting job to have to speak about yourself, but not talking for yourself. It's, it's an interesting, Jack, is probably one of the most amazing persons. He's extremely good looking and he is really intelligent. <laughs> and Jack loves to say that about himself. Okay, okay. We talked a lot about how um, different ranges of hearing loss should be referred to and what the preferred language is around defining this. Help us out with that. So, we today deaf people and hard of hearing people prefer the term to be called deaf or hard of hearing as opposed to hearing impaired. That impairedness is a word that you could just throw out the window because it's sort of akin to that old terminology of deaf people, deaf and dumb or deaf mute. It's sort of as we progressed to the point today, we prefer to be called deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, and speaking of that, there are some people, deaf community members, um, who call themselves and describe themselves with the big or capital D. Deaf, who, f who follow deaf culture as a description, as opposed to the medical description, the lowercase d. So, people have asked me, do deaf people see eye to eye in this respect about the capital D and lowercase d? And I say, no, they don't, not necessarily. We have different perspectives on a variety of things. But the most, the majority of people who are deaf prefer to be called deaf. Okay, we're gonna come back to some of those issues a little bit later on, but Marley, I know everyone is gonna to wanna to know about you. Firstly, tell us about your own experience um, when you became deaf and, and your childhood. Was there a community for you? I know you're from Chicago. Um, take us there. So I became deaf last week. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was born hearing in Chicago and became deaf at 18 months old. Uh, the cause, of course, is unknown. We don't know. 
my parents have said that it was from roseola, but I have heard that roseola doesn't necessarily cause deafness. Is that correct? Yeah. They thought, they were under the impression that, uh, and I'm not gonna argue with them about that. That was their impression. Uh, I really don't know how I became deaf. I remember growing up, going to first an oral educational program, probably at three years old. And I remember a teacher speaking at me and I didn't understand what was going on. It was just went completely over my head. It was very frustrating not being able to understand them, not being able to perform the way they wanted me to perform or to do what they wanted me to do. And it was, it was very frustrating. And I remember vividly at five, the night uh, that we went after dinner, when my mother told us we were going out at night, at five years old, how exciting, we went to Northwest University, Northwestern University, and into a very old building uh, with chairs arranged in a circle. And I was the only child in the room, and I was wondering what was going on, and suddenly, there was a teacher, a deaf teacher by the name of Sam Block, who started with the alphabet in sign language. And I had never seen anything, I'd never seen hands move like that. And that's the night that my life changed. And I began to pick up language immediately and went into the deaf program, the mainstream school, and I had both deaf education and signed interpreted classes in a hearing school. And I chose not to go to mainstream classes with interpreters. Uh, I was comfortable in my deaf ed classes because I could hang out with my friends who signed and the teacher signed. So that was my, that was my world. I was comfortable there. So at the same time, I grew up uh, going to speech therapy classes and I had private speech training because I loved it. That was the reason, simple as that. And it's pretty unusual for deaf children to really like speech classes. That was my choice, and it worked for me. And it still does. How did you transition into acting? When did you get interested in it? And when did you realize that it was something you wanted to do and make a profession about? I was a big reader of Judy Bloom books as a young child. I loved her books. I would devour every word. And I also played games in the bathroom for hours on end by myself where I would sign different characters, different songs, different roles to myself. I would do, I would be a, a garbage truck driver. I would be whatever it would be. And I really enjoyed myself by myself signing to myself. And my mother realized, well, wait a minute, she can't stay in the bathroom forever. <laughs> so she found a more productive outlet for my interest, and it was the Center on Deafness, located just a few miles from our home in suburban Chicago, where they had, were putting together a production of The Wizard of Oz. I was eight years old, and when I got there, I saw that there were deaf kids, and they were performing, and they were signing, and there was music, and it was the entire package that naturally, who was Dorothy? Of course, me. <laughs> <laughs> and. So I fell in love with acting uh, at that point, and I've, it was, a, it was a, just a, like a life's journey for me. It just made sense, and you can see as right now I am a ham, yeah. so. <laughs> and that's when I got hooked. And you loved it. I loved it. it, I, it I really got bit by the acting bug, and I've been doing it ever since. Amazing. You live in two worlds, though. Your, your husband is hearing correct, your children are. Talk to us about, about that, and, um, a little bit about how it pulls you in two different directions. Yeah, and I'm tired all the time. I'm tired all the time. <laughs> well, you've got four kids, yeah. so, yeah. Four kids. Do you want them, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love them. Um, people have asked me, oh, okay, so you've married a hearing guy. How is it that you communicate? How is it that you get along with your children? Being that they're all hearing, they all sign. They sign if they feel like it. <laughs> uh, my husband, Kevin, signs fairly, fairly, he's fairly well. We, we have uh, good communication most of the time. Um, times where we just, there is no communication, but I think that's natural among married couples anyway. Uh, everyone has those communication issues, hearing or deaf. But we work at it and 
to be honest, I do struggle a lot of times where uh, they're having a conversation and they don't wake up and say, okay, mom is deaf, so we're gonna have to interpret for mom. It's, they, they keep me in the loop, if you wanna call it that, most of the time during dinner, but a lot of times I do have to say, you're talking about what? Oh, okay, tell me what's so funny? What's going on? Um, it's, it's the same as I was growing up. In a hearing family, my parents at home, they had home signs. They weren't exactly fluent, and I had two older brothers who were hearing, and I did the best as I could. I mean, if, it would probably de be different if I was growing up now. There's a lot more exposure to, you know, about the importance of sign language and communication as opposed to when I grew up. I think it's a generational thing. This is a really good segue into the video uh, to get us into a deeper talk about some of the cultural issues, so thank you, Marley. Let's take a look at this um, video called Dear Hearing People. Dear Hearing People, we have some things to tell you about us. Sometimes we use a different language to communicate. Sometimes we can speak. Sometimes we don't. Some of us like to wear hearing aids or cochlear implants to hear. Some of us need interpreters to communicate with others. Please don't force us to wear hearing aids or lip read for your benefit. That is our personal and private choice. Don't make decisions for us without our participation or permission. You'd be shocked. We are doctors, lawyers, filmmakers, race car drivers, teachers, inventors, CEOs, chefs, video gamers, musicians, singers, comedians, writers, and parents. Need we say more? Sometimes we're perfectly happy being who we are. Most of the time, our struggles in society occur when other people make it difficult for us. Sometimes we are too tired to explain ourselves. We suggest that you simply ask us questions and be open. Don't be scared. Don't run away. Running away only means that you'll continue to not understand us. That lack of understanding will only hurt us more. We're human beings with thoughts and feelings, just like anyone else. Keller had a, an, an excellent um, remark where she said, deafness separates you from people, blindness separates you from things. Mm. Talk Only about that. Only if you let it. Only if you let it. That's my words I'm adding. Got it, right. Because, I mean, I understand what you, I respect Helen Keller so much, but today I think, today we are normal people. The only thing we don't do is hear, like you do. And I think that that quote, it, I, it, 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 it kind of, I, I kind context. of cringe. Sure. It is exactly a historical so, context, so, and I respect that. I respect that. But I wanted to add that only if you let it. Only if you let it. But at the time when Helen Keller was uh, so prominent, there was a uh, a movement by Alexander Graham Bell to sort of prevent the development of American Sign Language. Can you talk to that a little bit, Jim? As has already been said, this is really a question of a generational mm -hmm. change. I mean, there was a point at which the deaf community was extremely isolated, had very poor opportunities in the workplace. Repressed, repressed, yes. repressed. Re repressed That's even. The point, yeah. And very poor educational opportunities. So at that point, the communication issue was a, a real uh, life impediment, uh, and that is now very different. Among other things, there's now much better, better medical testing at an early age. 
So every child born in hospital now is tested. And we no longer have children who go two or three or four or even five years mm -hmm. before somebody realizes that they're not acquiring language normally because they don't hear normally. Right. Yeah. And yep. I, if you don't mind if I jump in, thank you for bringing that up about hospitals requiring by law to test children for their hearing before they are released to go home. Mm -hmm. However, my, our problem is, the deaf community problem is, is with those in the hospital administrations don't provide enough information or resources to parents who might find out, yes, that my child is deaf, then what do I do? For example, my parents never knew that there was such a thing as deaf children even. And we're talking about 1965. Let's say, no, 32, how is that possible? 1965, anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so today, I mean, hospitals today will give you paperwork, says, okay, here's an option, cochlear implant, here's another option, that really, they don't go into depth, they talk about the, the benefits of American Sign Language, all the different options that are available that you can provide to your child, whether you can even explore them or, or even Google them. And there is still a great deal of pressure that people should explore the option of cochlear implants because that's better than signing, that you shouldn't sign. And I would say to these people, who are you to decide for us and how to define ourselves as people who are deaf? So that's why I think we need to have a discussion among educational professionals who only see deaf people as black and white. Bring in deaf people, bring in the viewpoints to those who have newly born children who are deaf. People ask me, so Marley, would you have a cochlear implant? And I would say, no, no. That brings a question when you mentioned and talked about at the beginning of the program, who is eligible for it? Uh, it's not for everyone, and it doesn't work for everyone. And in my case, my deaf world, it's all visual. So that's why we choose to sign, because sign language is visual. For those who might have a progressive hearing loss, who chose a cochlear implant, I think that's fine, because you have a background of being hearing, as opposed to those who have never heard, who then, I mean, I would say to people, I'm not opposed to cochlear implants because I, who am I to decide for those individuals? It's not up to me. If it works for them, great. If it doesn't, well, that's why I'm a huge advocate for American Sign Language for children because we depend on our eyes, not our ears. And, and, and as we said, sign language involves culture. Uh -huh. The deaf community, the capital D, involves culture, education, anyway. Okay. In, in light of that, define what you mean by culture. Define the modern deaf culture. What does that mean? Modern deaf culture means there's a language there. Mm -hmm. American so it's about sign language. the language. There is a language. It's about the language. It's about our art. Mm -hmm. It's about our education. It's about our community. Remember that sign language is itself. Oh, by the way, sign language is not international, by the way. So every single sign language community you can think of has its own culture, has its own language. So it doesn't mean that all deaf people can understand each other all over the world. Deaf culture is extremely strong, and I am very proud to be a member of it. And it's very precious, and that's why we are always having to fight against those who try to control our lives, who try to tell us what is best for us, because they don't know. They're not deaf. Understood. Let the, a very, you want to say something and then we'll get to the video. Well, I just want to make, make sure. a comment. So I'm not one of those who wants to control anybody. So but what, this is the reason I brought up the issue of the number of people in different categories right. of hearing loss. It's not monolithic. It's, it's not monolithic. Right. So the deaf community that we have just been talking about comprises on the order of half a million to a million people who are totally deaf, mostly from birth or from very early, so-called prelingually, before the acquisition of language. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be very different for you or for me if we lost our hearing tomorrow, mm -hmm. which could happen from a viral infection or the like. People in that category have a very hard time, it takes a long time, to acquire good ASL skills and so on. Whereas for them, a hearing aid or a cochlear implant promises at least some relief on a much shorter time scale. So they're different communities, mm -hmm. and one shouldn't see this as a monolithic Our, deaf community. Do you agree with that, Marley? Oh, absolutely I agree, I do, absolutely. It makes sense. Clearly, I, 
I, there are families that are exposed to deaf culture and learn about deaf culture uh, because they have deaf daughters or children and they learn to respect that culture. It's, I mean, my parents, my parents didn't have that exposure because it wasn't out there at the time. The resources weren't available at the time. So I can't necessarily blame them for not being fluent signers. But they did raise me as any child should be raised, and that's with love and respect. And right, they let, got it. Let's take a look at this documentary from, it was, it's a little old, it's from the year 2000. Um, it was made by a documentary maker by the name of Joss Aronson. It's called The Sound and the Fury. And it's, it really highlights the complexity of this discussion between uh, in one family where there are hearing members and there are also deaf members, and now um, a father who is himself deaf must make a decision about his own daughter who is also deaf, but grandma who hears, she has a slightly different opinion. We want to move to Maryland because we believe that's what's best for the kids. All we feel is that you're putting a fence around the children because you believe it's the right thing in raising them in that community. You are moving, you are limiting your children, you are forcing them, Ma, wait a minute. You are forcing them to live only in a deaf world. You are not, that's not true, Marion, that is not true. You told me before, I don't want my daughter to suffer the same way I did. I would want her to hear music, I would want her to enjoy life. I did not have that. Well, what are you doing uh, uh, now? Uh, uh. Marion, when I saw the kids in that school, I realized that because of their sign language, their language and writing abilities were equal to the hearing kids. You may be 100% correct. Maybe it's the best school for the deaf in the world. My feeling, you are moving your family to escape an issue that's going on here, cochlear implant. Ma, I know how you feel about the cochlear implant, but I don't want the implant for Heather. That's it. That's my final decision. In Maryland, we'll have more opportunities, more interpreters, more communication. Deaf people are accepted there. Living in Maryland would be better for our kids. We're a deaf family. Peter and I grew up deaf. We know what it's like growing up in a hearing culture. We could do better for our kids. You don't understand you deaf want to accept feelings. one way, deaf way. There are both worlds here. You only want deaf world for your children. They have to live in both worlds. You, why did you go for cochlear? Why? She was curious. Curious? That's bull. She said to me, I want to be like the same. I want to hear the music. I want to dance. That's wanting to live in both worlds. So you're saying we're limiting our children? <laughs> I think my blood pressure just went up 200 points. <laughs> What's the answer? I get the mom's passion for what she wants for her grandchildren. I'm a mother, I know. But then as I watched the grandmother say, trying to preach to her, don't deny your children a cochlear implant. And at the same time, she's signing, she's signing. So she's using the language that her daughter, and or it's her son, it's her son, and her daughter-in-law are using so that she could be understand by her mother. So there's communication there, there's language there. And then she's trying to convince them that they need to hear. Um, I would think that she would probably have a, more compassion for deaf culture, that culture is what we want, that we don't want to be taken down. Deaf culture is a beautiful culture. We have our own viable language. We have education. We have arts. We have community. It's all wonderful. I mean, we have wonderful lawyers. We have a civil rights attorney sitting in the room who's deaf. We have someone who started, uh, she's an entrepreneur and she has her own jewelry line. There, there, there are so many opportunities for people who are deaf who sign. Let's hold that thought. We're going to come back to that. We're going to move now to talk about vision, which has its own issues. So our next participant is a leading expert in the science of vision. He holds degrees from Princeton and Stanford, where he's currently a professor of neurosurgery, ophthalmology, and electrical engineering. Please welcome E.J. Chichilniski. <laughs> e.
EJ, just like we uh, tasks, tasked James, we'd like to ask you to give us a little introduction into how Site works, explain that so we can uh, get into our conversation. So Sight begins in the retina of the eye. It's a sheet of neural tissue at the rear of the eye. It's what the eye doctor sees when they look into your eye. And the retina catches the light that's incident on the eye and, and transforms it substantially into electrical signals that it then sends to the brain, as shown in the schematic on the left-hand side. It's actually very complex. The signals go to many different targets in the brain, unlike what's shown in this simple diagram, but you get the idea. So because the eye or the retina is the primary site of vision loss, uh, we sort of zoom in on that when we think about vision loss and vision restoration. So on the left, you can see a sort of cross-sectional schematic of the eye that shows that light from the visual world or imagery from the visual world is focused onto the retina, which is at the rear of the eye. And on the, on the right there, you can see the neural circuitry of the retina that consists of multiple different cell types. The first cell types, the photoreceptors, capture the light and transform it into electrical signals. A second layer of cells performs many different computations or transformations on those electrical signals. And then finally, the so-called retinal ganglion cells are responsible for sending those visual signals from the retina to the brain, and that initiates vision. And what we don't know in detail is how the brain puts together all this complex information to give rise to our experience of seeing but we do know that it all begins in the circuitry that I just told you about. So what I want to emphasize is that there are many different cell types within the retina. In fact, there are even the photoreceptors and interneurons in the middle and the ganglion cells at the back that send the information to the brain. There's multiple types of e even of those cells. They're very different from one another. They transform visual information differently. You can think of them as multiple different types of Photoshop filters. And they send that information to a variety of different targets in the brain. So, you can think of the retina as a complex processing device, if you will, that captures the image, transforms it in a whole bunch of different ways, and sends those signals to a number of different targets. In that way, it's, it's substantially different from audition, because a lot of interesting processing takes place right there at the beginning, right there in the eye. Now, the primary diseases that give rise to vision loss, ones that you've heard about, such as macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, and others, which are the primary sources of vision loss uh, in the developed world. They attack the retina in a variety of different ways. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. In the developing world, there are additional uh, sources of vision loss that are much less of a problem in a country like the United States, such as simply untreated refractive error, uh, for example, or cataracts that go untreated. But in a country like the United States, the loss of the retinal circuitry due to ge degeneration is perhaps the major, so is the major so uh, source of vision loss, um, giving rise to blindness in millions of people. Okay, so it's a pro can you give us a little bit about the epidemiology, at least in this country, what we're looking at? Sure, we're looking at a couple of million or a few million people from each of those major sources, age-related <coughs> macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, hundreds of thousands of people from retinitis pigmentosa, so in all, millions. Um, and again, that's in the United States. Okay. All right. Well, for many blind people, they obviously navigate the world very successfully using many different methods. Some use canes, some use guide dogs. Uh, but we're about to meet a guy who has really uh, invented his own way to see the world, um, and he's helped others do the same. I want you to take a look at this video. That's him in the center. Okay. You might not realize, but he is blind. He's a terrific guy, and I'd like you to welcome Daniel Kish. <laughs> Daniel, welcome. I would like you to tell people exactly what you quote unquote invented uh, as a sort of unique way to navigate the world, and if you can explain how it gives you sort of 360 vision. I think I'm going to demonstrate. So it's a process of seeing with sound called echolocation. I didn't invent it. Uh, bats were doing it long before <laughs> I was. Um, but um, I invented ways of teaching it. And so that's really what I'd like to focus on uh, for the moment. So basically, it's emitting signals that uh, the human brain can learn to recruit its visual cortex uh, to visualize. So patterns of echoes come back, the visual brain goes, aha, I can use that, and 
literally creates uh, images that we can use to get around. And what I'd like to do is sort of demonstrate so that you get a sense, a sense of what I hear when this happens, okay? So we have this sign, and I'll just go into the middle. Obviously, I know where it is. I know where it isn't. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I know. So if you would close your eyes, everyone, it's an auditory demonstration. Um, and uh, I'm going to make a sound, a shh, sound. But listen to what happens to that sound as I approach the sign. So I'm going to move my body toward the sign. You're not changing your... So I'm not changing, you can open your eyes for the moment. So I'm not changing the sound, but as I approach the surface, the sound changes, and I can actually get to within a fraction of an inch, because that's just what I know. Now, I'd like to test you. So close your eyes. It's a science quiz. So all I want you to do is uh, stop me before I hit the sign. So. <clears throat> so, <laughs> very simple, uh, with your eyes closed. So you'll just listen to me making the sound, and you're going to hear that sound start to shift as I approach the sign. And that's when you'd say stop, or now, or pretty much anything to keep me from crashing into the sign, okay? <laughs> Here we go. Open your eyes. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's how, yeah. how, how you that works. This? Tell us about how you figured out that this was a really useful way to get um, around. I learned to see with it in much the same way I think that sighted children learn to see with their vision. Learn seeing is a learned skill. We're born with the predisposition to do it, but we have to learn it. So if I were to ask you, or any of you, how you learned to see, tell me about that. Tell me when you first realized that it was useful. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, I was click, I, I lost my first eye at seven months, my second at 13 months. They were removed uh, from uh, retinal cancer. And so my parents report to me that I was clicking by about the age of 15 to 18 months. And clicking and is another version of this, right? Yeah. So that's the signal that I use as a tongue click. And it tells me what I need to know, pretty much. Um, and it can work for up to hundreds of meters, depending on the surface type and, and environment. And my parents realized quite, well, like I say, between 15 and 18 months that I knew things. I knew what was around me. Um, I wasn't afraid, I didn't get lost, that kind of thing. And your parents were very instrumental in really facilitating this and encouraging you to, to yeah. be independent, basically. They just, they, they weren't really bothered by the blindness. The blindness wasn't much of a concern to them. Um, they just felt that I would somehow learn uh, to enjoy the same freedoms and responsibilities as others. And so I was encouraged to do that from day one, which meant pretty much being involved in, in all the things that children do uh, with the idea that you would become, that I would become involved in all the things that adults do. Without realizing it, they were basically following a s pretty simple human equation. And that essentially is that if you put a certain thing in to one end of an equation, you can't necessarily expect to get a totally different thing out the other end. So if you put into one end, dependency and restriction and fear, which, alas, is probably what most blind children and indeed adults experience, you don't somehow get independence and freedom and assurance out the other end. There's no magic alchemy that takes place in the middle of this equation anywhere. So, but if you put in uh, independence and freedom and assurance, if you put in all of those opportunities from day one, at one end, that's pretty much what you're going to get out the other. 
Now you, you are actually able to teach this to others. Tell us about that, what's the experience like, and how are other parents sort of um, feeling about echolocation? It, it, it's really a whole paradigm of instruction of which echolocation is a part. Uh, obviously, echolocation has its advantages. You can see that I'm not without my cane, um, which I've also reformed how that's taught and how that's used. Um, uh, which I've had to do because really you, there's been too much of trying to understand not seeing from a seeing perspective, trying to understand blindness from a sighted perspective. It's a logical impossibility. So you have to step back and you have to understand blindness from a blindness perspective. You have to understand not seeing from a not seeing perspective. And when you do that, you unlock a whole whole realm of human potential that, um, see what he yeah. said? Okay. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Wait, he is a wonderful again, example of what we said earlier. That attitude that we should all learn and pick up from the people who actually experience it. Okay, repeat it then, please, so everyone has heard it clearly. It's bringing an understanding of, uh, of, of an experience um, by those who experience it. So how can a seeing person understand blindness? Um, it can't be done. So um, when you bring blind people into the equation, then you get things like echolocation. You get, you get things like uh, a, a level of mobility that just hasn't been historically uh, witnessed. And that's what we do. So, so, so basically, we bring uh, a whole different perspective, a whole different paradigm of understanding uh, how to completely kind of reshape the brain uh, around adapting to blindness rather than, I guess, fearing blindness or feeling that your blindness requires uh, supervision in order to function. Um, and so uh, it's... It's bringing a whole a whole new perspective on on the the process of, of understanding blindness. Very important point to move into the next discussion, which is looking at how there's been a lot of research into either restoring sight, restoring hearing, new technologies, and talking about the quote unquote cure. Let's start with hearing, Jim. Most hearing loss is is congenital. Um, Explain, go back to the hair cell, explain how that is sort of like the critical factor in looking at some of these new technologies and uh, explain that if you would, Mike. Okay. So most hearing loss is not congenital. The congenital is a very small sorry, fraction. Correct. Most of it is acquired and most of it is acquired post-lingually. So in people who have learned to speak and hear and who do so routinely and now find their lives compromised as their hearing begins to deteriorate. Now, one long-term hope is that we'll be able to actually restore the hair cells. As I mentioned, we start with only some 16,000 in each ear, mm -hmm. and as they're lost from any of the five conditions that I mentioned, they're not replaced. Uh, but they are replaced in animals such as fish, in amphibians, in reptiles, including birds. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with mammals? Somehow, the genes that are necessary to restore these cells have turned off in mammals. And one thing that many of us hope we can do is to learn how to turn them back on. So on the left is a normal hair bundle in a normal hair cell, such as the sort that I showed you earlier. And on the right is what happens with age or exposure to drugs or any of a number of other conditions that cause the hair cell to die. The next slide shows the structure of the ear dissected from an animal. This is from a mouse. You can see the cock cochlea, but also various other organs, the saccule and utricle, that are involved in our sense of balance. And they use just the same sort of hair cells that our cochlea uses. So we hope that if we can learn how to restore those cells, we'll subsequently be able to apply the same techniques to the cochlea as well. So we and a lot of other people use the utricle. This is this beautiful thing on the right with some 2,000 hair cells in the normal case. In the next slide, you'll see that new cells, which are marked as white dots, cease to form in the growing utricle around the time of birth. 
But with the application of certain drugs that various people have found, we can restore an enormous amount of proliferation. So all the white dots, of which there are a thousand or so in the right-hand picture, represent newly developed cells, some of which will turn into hair cells. So this is the long-term dream, mm -hmm. to restore the, the condition, more or less, of youth, to recapitulate the development and to produce a normal cochlea. Now, until that happens, one of the major ways of dealing with hearing loss, what we've been discussing at some length, is the cochlear prosthesis or the implant. And I have a short demonstration of that that gives you some sense of what the device does. All right, let's okay. see what you do. So this time when I say go, they'll both be on together, okay? okay. So, that, so do you want to watch his face? Yeah. And it's going to be on in three, two, one, go. Hi, buddy. Hi, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. Oh, it's okay, buddy. So this gives you some idea of how the implant or prosthesis works. Basically, there's an externally worn device that's sort of like a hearing aid. It picks up sound from the environment, breaks it down into different frequencies, the job that the hair cells normally do, and then sends that electrical information down a wire. So you see at the left the externally worn device, then you see the wire that's tunneled surgically into the cochlea, and it ends in a series of electrodes that actually shock the cochlear nerve that sends information on into the brain. A cross section through that implant is shown on the right, and you can see two little electrodes, the sort of mushroom-shaped objects. When current is passed between them, that will stimulate the nerve fiber that is running just nearby, and a particular frequency of sound will be heard by that person. This is one that is now more than 20 years old. I use the picture just because it's really simple to explain. It's easier to understand than the more modern ones. The idea is that this is surgically implanted into the bottom portion of the cochlea, and it has in it eight pairs of little metal electrodes. So each of the little shiny buttons is a pair of electrodes between which current can be passed. Now, what I'm going to do in the way of this demonstration is to play a snippet of human speech in which I've thrown away all of the information but five narrow frequency channels. It's quite distorted, so don't be surprised that you don't understand much, but here's what an early cochlear prosthesis perhaps would have sounded like. So probably few of you, if any, heard anything at all. Now, the next one is similar, the same conversation, but 10 channels. And you'll begin to capture a few words. So what words did anybody get? Nothing? Everything. Not me. Everything? Not, not you? <laughs> Marley said not me. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure some of you got a few words. OK. OK, the next one is. The next, the next one is 20 channels. So 20 channels is approaching the state of the art as of a decade ago. The cochlear prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. So, yeah. Prosthesis, prosthesis yeah. 1,000 people. 1,000 world, worldwide, et cetera, okay? So it's still pretty distorted, but you begin to hear things. Typically now, prostheses have about 30 channels. They're not all active at the same time. Now I'm going to play the original snippet of speech. The cochlear prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. It's now 400,000. But now listen to 20 channels again, and you can't not understand it. The cochlear prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. It has a rather a remarkable effect. I mean, the brain rapidly adapts to this, and indeed people who get these implants, postlingual people who used to speak and hear before they had a problem, very rapidly accommodate them and can comprehend speech again. Let's talk about the brain, though. And Marley, I'd, I'd like to hear from you as well. There is... <laughs> <laughs> as Marley's interpreter, I was trying to hold myself back because it looked like she was going to explode out okay. of her chair. <laughs> All right, Marley, you go first. You go first. Go ahead. I love you. Okay. I love you. I really do. First of all, this would be for people who have a progressive hearing loss, clearly, because they've heard before. Exactly. And then it comes with training. 
obviously. You need to be able to train to hear. Now, let's talk about those individuals, those babies born deaf who have never heard a sound before. To the day that their parents decide to give them a cochlear implant. And they have to go get training to learn to hear a sound they've never heard before. And what takes, what, two, three, four, five years of constant and consistent training. But then I would think maybe perhaps, depending on the individual, how well they can adapt or learn quickly enough to understand these sounds. But you know what? And I can speak for those profoundly deaf who have never heard before, as opposed to those who have heard before. At the end of the day, when they take those implants off, they're still deaf. They can't hear. So that's why I, we, people in the deaf community, advocate for culture, for, uh, for, I mean, sign language is communication. I know I'm, I'm confusing the issue here. Are they mutually exclusive? Say that again? Are they mutually exclusive? You can, you can, you, you can have cochlear implants with language, sign language, but when you don't have hearing, everything is visual, so why not use sign language? It's, it makes sense. That's why we sign. Nobody told us to, we, it's, it's within you. As a person who is deaf, it's a language that makes sense for us. So now you're talking about cochlear implants and giving us a language that doesn't make sense for us. What about the developmental issues around this? There's, and then, you know, I'd like to hear from well, you. Well, you need Jen. language, you need language. You need language. So if you're focusing on the mechanics, what's the language? Hearing babies that are born, they don't speak, but they, you know, they don't say I'm hungry, I'm tired, or whatever, they can't speak. But we, See, if, if you teach them language, sign language, which they can't do, they're communicating with you. It's the same concept. You're giving people the mechanics of language, but not the language itself. And language is the key to communication. Okay, Jim? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And one shouldn't get the impression that the two of us were separated because we anticipated Fisticuffs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> this is a bad place no, to be. No, we're going to have a beer later. No, we're going to have a beer I mean, later. I, I, I'm, I'm in entirely supportive of the point of view that's just been enunciated. And again, I make the point that we're talking, I think, about two different things. We're talking about a deaf culture of people who are congenitally deaf, often part of a deaf family, who can effectively learn to sign from a very early age and be part of a deaf culture, capital D. We're talking, on the other hand, with a cochlear prosthesis about people like many others in the audience who are adults, who have never learned to sign, who abruptly become deaf or progressively mm -hmm. become deaf. For them, the prosthesis is a viable option. Oh, and, and somewhere in the middle, there's people in the middle too. There's people in the middle. What do we do about those people? Those are personal choices. Exactly. You are exactly right. Okay. Daniel, I want to get your opinion, and then I want to move to EJ, because we want to compare what's happening in sight. Do you have a perspective on this in terms of we're talking about hearing right now, we're going to come to vision. Is there anything from your perspective that can, you can share with us or your thoughts as you listen to this? My perspective on, uh, on, on recovery and restoration uh, is a different question. I take a different angle on it. I, I think that science provides us all with options, and I think those options are, are really good, uh, all of us. Um, but I think, and I think, and I think the science should continue forward. And I and I agree with the idea of personal choice, and and individuals having access to personal choice. But I think that uh, we're maybe asking the wrong questions because if we restore hearing, if we restore vision. Um, we're still left with uh, <coughs> gaps, significant holes, significant dark places in human consciousness, which is really what, the only thing that really makes all of these things seem like a problem. So uh, if you ask many blind people, and I certainly will not speak for the blind community, but if you ask many blind people, they will tell you that the hardest part about blindness is not the physical limitations, that are presum presumably uh, imposed by blindness, it is about the social barriers that are imposed by society. 
So it really. <laughs> yeah. 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 Daniel, I always say, so, I always say, and that's well, that's, well, that's well said, I always say the real handicap of being deaf is not in the ear, it's in the mind. Okay. So if we're going to cure anything, <laughs> okay. that's where we should go. All right. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, EJ. So, <laughs> all right. So... We, we've, talked, we've talked about some of the issues with, around hearing. They describe hearing as sort of uh, the cochlea as like a single instrument, but the eye really needs a symphony in order to perceive. What's happening scientifically? Talk to us about what you're working on, and then we're gonna come back to what we just discussed. We and others before us have worked on, from the scientific community, have worked on technological ways to address the loss of, the, of sight uh, directly. What happens in many sources of vision loss, notably macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, is a loss of the photoreceptor cells, which are at the rear of the eye. So when you lose the photoreceptor cells due to genetic disorders or other, or other processes in the, in the retina, you are now blind because you can no longer take in the light, absorb it, and transform it into the electrical signals that underlie our sense of vision. Now, Interestingly, a lot of the neural circuitry of the retina remains under these conditions, more or less intact, particularly the cells that send the visual information to the brain are in large numbers intact. So from somebody who thinks from a technological scientific point of view, this brings up a very interesting alternative shown in the next uh, build, which is the idea of an artificial retina or a retinal prosthesis. And conceptually, this is a device that replaces a function of the retinal circuitry that's been lost to disease. This device would capture the visual image, transform it into electrical signals that are then processed by the circuitry in between, and then electrically stimulate the remaining neurons in the retina, the retinal ganglion cells, causing them to send electrical activity to the brain. Now, if you do that exactly right, in principle, you can replace the function of the lost neurons that have been lost to disease. That's the concept. Mm -hmm. Now, we are definitely not the first people to think of that concept. People have been thinking about this for decades, and some people have actually done it in first-pass attempts. And as I'll tell you in a minute, it's different from the development of cochlear prostheses. But and maybe we can illustrate that by showing you what happens with the first-generation devices that have been implanted in individuals who are blind for many years, who had sight early on, so they learned vision, and they lost their vision. And then they had devices, simple first-generation devices of this kind implanted. So what you'll see is a video in a moment that shows a simulation of what a blind person sees who's had one of these implants. On the left, what you'll see is a, is a little movie, and on the right, you'll see a simulation performed by my colleagues, Ioni Fine and colleagues, of what they might see with the implant. As you can see, it's not a close approximation to right. what's happening in the visual environment. It's, you know, version 1.0 of devices like this that we try to implant. And I don't mean to be critical. It's very hard to do this. And one of the reasons that it's hard is that the retina is much more complex than the cochlea in the sense that there's all these different cell types that do all this kind of processing that I mentioned to you a few minutes before. So that's why this is far from what we would want to restore naturalistic vision. Another video that was brought on yep. by your folks is shown yep. next to give you a sense of the While impact it can of have. Research have convinced Dr. Ayazi it's possible this next moment convinces him. This is another simulation, there. an optimistic one. Yeah. What do you see? And this individual is having an implant <laughs> turned on. That's With family members in tears, Alan is given his first glimpse of his wife Carmen in more than 10 years. This is what his camera is capturing right now. This is the frame. So those are the pixels in the camera. What he sees is cruder than that. So, you know, he's not really seeing his wife's face the way that you would expect to. He's getting a very, very crude representation of what's out there. But you can see that it has a profound emotional impact on this individual to see something, to see even a shadow of what he might have seen before. So that's, not, that's not to in any way detract or disagree with the comments that have been stated. Those are really legitimate from people who really know what it's like. On the other hand, you can have a profound impact on individuals by 
technologically restoring some of their sensation. And it's an interesting question. When would you want to and how do you give people the choice to have an experience like this? Is it worth it? Does it change your life in a way that you want? Well, that might depend a lot on what your goals are and where you're, go where you're going with that sensory cap capability. Where, where is it evolving to? What so, again, coming from the scientific point of view, we think that this kind of imagery that you see with current devices is not likely to be the be-all and end-all. And in fact, the people who receive devices like this uh, don't give up their canes or their guide dogs or the other clever assistive approaches that they've developed for this technology that's not that useful <laughs> for their daily life. Why is it? Why is it that these devices don't perform very well? So, as I mentioned to you before, the retina is complex, and the next animation gives you a sense of what it's like for all the different retinal cell types to send information to the brain, but first I want to point out that the retina is not a camera. So what does a camera do? It captures the visual image and it produces a, an image that ideally looks a lot like the, like the initial image, so that's a camera, right? Now what does the retina do? It doesn't do that, it does something else shown at the bottom, which is to take the signals in and transform them very substantially and send them as electrical patterns of impulses to a variety of different brain targets. So it's really unlike a camera. You can't treat it like a camera, you can't replace it like a camera, you have to do something more. And now to give you an animation of the sense of that in the next slide, it gives you a sense of what's going on. You have many different cell types sending many different patterns of electrical activity to many different uh, regions in the brain. They don't closely resemble the pixels in the image. They vary in, in a variety of super interesting ways that I study and people like me study. And so if you interface to them, you're trying to reproduce patterns like that. Now unfortunately, the different ganglion cell types are not laid out for you in these separate sheets that are super easy to access. Instead, as shown in the next build, they are actually all mixed up with one another on the retinal surface. So if you come in with an electronic device, as shown in the next build, what you see is that if you stimulate with a grid of electrodes and treat it like a grid of pixels and try to stimulate the cells, there's no way you can create those distinct patterns in the different cell types that normally reproduce visual function. So all current devices work in this simple way. They treat the retina in a sort of oversimplified fashion because, as if the retina were more like the cochlea, which is a, a simpler organ. So to overcome this, to make devices that provide better artificial vision, uh, what we do is to try to figure out how to reproduce those natural patterns of activity. So we perform fine-grained, large-scale electrical recording and stimulation from the retina. We figure out what the different cell types are and what they're normally supposed to be doing. Then we pass current and record from many different electrodes simultaneously and do it in clever ways to try to reproduce the naturalistic patterns of activity that occur in the different cell types. So again, just bringing back to this conversation, this is sort of the opposite side of this. This is a full-on science and technology approach to this problem. This is in no way a discussion of what are the cultural impacts or how, what choices should people make, no. This is about providing choices. This is about introducing a technology that says, well, here's a thing you could do if, if you want to do something with your visual world that's different from the way, um, let's say, Daniel navigates his visual world. And I think it's important to recognize that, that the science is not about forcing something on people. It's about providing alternatives. So we develop techniques for doing that. That's the purpose of the research in my lab, and we have a project at Stanford University where I work with a number of different collaborators, developing the technology, figuring out how to make tiny electrode arrays, figuring out how to record and stimulate and reproduce the normal patterns of activity. I think it's also worth providing a little bit of a pointer about the implications Yep. of these technologies Well, beyond we began the conversation, the, the title of the talk is Cure for these things, so yeah, yeah I, speak to that. I never use the word cure when, okay. I, when I describe our work. And in fact, when my PhD students put the word cure into an abstract, I take it out. And I say, I call it a treatment. It's a way to mm -hmm. change option. what's going on in the retinas of these individuals that gives them options. But there's a whole lot of things that are gonna be addressed with this kind of technology that our society needs to discuss in the same way that we're having this fascinating discussion. So, you know, we have, for example, memory loss that occurs in many aging individuals as our population ages, that's an increasing problem. Many psychiatric disorders that involve dysfunction of the brain circuitry. Many uh, forms of paralysis that prevent us from moving our limbs or, or therefore interacting with the world in certain physical ways. 
And in some cases, you might want to replace this with technological, scientific approaches. So what we think is that this kind of approach, where we're looking at the neural circuitry of the retina and saying, look, this is a circuit that does certain things. It's complex, it's rich, it's beautiful. We try to figure it out. Can we build a device that can connect to that, know what it normally does, and replace the function of a portion of it? If we can do that, we think we can do a whole lot of other things that treat other disorders or in, and even in the future uh, augment our capabilities. Why do I think that? It turns out that in area, any area of the brain you have multiple different cell types, they do different things, they receive information from different sources, and they send information to other targets in the brain. It's kind of the same problem recapitulated over and over again. So if you want to treat paralysis, memory loss, psychiatric disorders, already we do deep brain stimulation, and so on, we think that there may be sort of a general approach to doing this by building those, that kind of circuitry, and we think that that has a lot of promise. It also has another promise that I'll say, and then I'll shut up, I promise, which is, um, which is augmentation of function. There's no bright line between treating a lost disorder, if you will, somebody who, or a lost uh, ca capability, such as hearing, if you lost your hearing at some point in your life, and augmenting your capacity, giving you more capacities. Um, it sounds a little bit science fiction-ish that we might, you know, provide ourselves augmented capacities that other humans don't have, but it's not science fiction. It's science now. People are working on this. Companies have been started doing this. We are very tuned into that because we think that developing these kind of technologies will open up a whole raft of possibilities for where humanity can go. Choices. So, so basically, it's going to get a lot more complicated. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, thank you. We're going to be having that. a lot of discussions like this. <laughs> You know what? We're going to end on that. More education, more love.